Great. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to start with the final presentation of today. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Chris Pomeroy, or Chris Pomeroy, who is in charge of the Pomeroy Surname Project. Now, um, Chris was an early pioneer of um, DNA testing within the context of a surname-based genealogy. And he wrote his first book on the subject in 2004. Uh, and lecturing across the country in more than 60 venues over the past decade. He has written two papers for the Journal of Genetic Genealogy outlining the key methods used to combine traditional genealogical research with genetic testing. And he's lectured on behalf of Family Tree DNA, the world's leading provider of genetic tests for genealogists since 2011. And of course, Family Tree DNA are just across here. So, ladies and gentlemen, can I give you uh, an introduction to Mr. Chris Conroy? Well, thank you. Can everyone hear me clearly with this microphone? Is that loud enough? Okay. Um, I feel a little constrained here because normally I'm one of these speakers that likes to prowl up and down, and I get to look at my slides. So I'm going to look at them off, off, off the, uh, the front here today. Um, it's going to be interesting because I'm doing a new presentation. I do a new one every year for Who Do You Think You Are? And what I'm going to talk to you about today is I'm going to give you a little bit of um, some examples from my own project, the Pomeroy Y chromosome project, but I'm also going to give you some thoughts about um, the future of surname studies using DNA testing, because actually that is, is, is where we're heading with this combination of DNA and documentary research being put together. Um, at the bottom here you'll see my website, dnaandfamilyhistory.com. Um, that's, that's the title of the first book I wrote in 2004, and um, uh, just to let you know a little bit more about my background, I've, although I've been lecturing on behalf of Family Tree DNA since 2011, I've actually been lecturing on DNA since 2002, so uh, I feel as though we're, we're, I've seen the whole of the first generation of DNA development in this country. Um, I've also published two papers in the Journal of Genetic Genealogy, about how you combine um, DNA and documentary research. And this is a very, very um, early area of, of development, and people are still trying to work out what the rules are and what the best methods are to, to achieve it. But um, within my own group, we've, we've rather been in, in abeyance for a number of years because I've been involved in other things, but we've recently decided that we need to spend a little bit of time um, trying to finalize our project, our surname project, because 2016 is the 950th anniversary of the arrival of William the Conqueror. And we're going to hold a reunion in 2016. I suspect like a lot of Norman surnames, Norman origin surnames. And we want to try and present our final, finalized results. Uh, maybe we'll never have final results, but we'd like to have something um, in a format where we can hand out to people and say, the project's now done. So after 15 years, of DNA testing, what are, the, what are the key questions? Well, the question we ask of the Y chromosome data now is how effective is Y chromosome data, DNA testing at revealing the ancestral origins of any, any given surname, any surname you might hold? That's always been the focus for the last 15 years. Um, I think at this point I'll just spend a little time because has everybody clear in their minds what the Y chromosome is? Is anyone not clear? So, if I just remind you briefly, the Y chromosome is only held by men. So when you're testing using the Y chromosome, you're testing the father's, 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 father's line. The reason this is very useful for genealogists is that exactly the transmission of the surname from father to son exactly mimics that, that genetic trans um, passing on of the DNA data in the Y chromosome. So Y chromosomes and surnames go together like uh, bread and butter. So the key question we've been asking up to now is if we, if we test uh, on the Y chromosome a whole bunch of men with the same surname, those results are very useful in determining whether they have connections with each other and whether you can see a, a, a distinct ancestral origin to the surname. But we're coming now into the next generation, which is why I put the second question down there below. So what is the key question we're going to be asking in the future? 
And I think that's going to be what, what is the relevance of Y chromosome DNA testing for my surname or for your surname. But when we look at all the surname results in particular in general, and we put them together and we, 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 we compare one surname with another, what more information can we discover about how surnames are linked together using Y chromosome results? So this is, as it were, the first 15 years, and this will be the next 15 years. And this change is, it's not a black and white change that's going to happen overnight. It's something that's, that's happening now. And there are one or two projects, my own included, which have reached a stage now where there are actually very little additional testing of individuals that we need to do in order to find out any more new information about the surname. Actually, for us, what would be more useful would be to compare our results and the haplotypes within our results with lots of other surnames. And those could be surnames that are local to where our surname is based, or it could be other Anglo-Norman surnames, or there could be any number of ways in which you analyse the total field of surnames within the United Kingdom and come up with useful surnames to uh, uh, compare with. So, let's have a look at how people actually conduct um, DNA tests within a surname context at the moment. Well, basically, there are two research routes. The first route would be led by the DNA, and the second route would be led by um, traditional documents in a traditional genealogical approach. Um, in my own project, we actually started along the document side first because there was a pre existing. Uh, genealogical project that had been going on for about 10 or 15 years before DNA testing came along. So there was already a family association that used to meet from time to time, there was a newsletter, uh, and there was a lot of research being collated. So we took this, this route too. That's, that's less common because the most common route is through route one. And um, I'll explain how this is. There's a slight variations within those two routes, but the eagle-eyed amongst you will already have noticed that they end up in the same place. So rule one, where your research within a surname is led by the DNA, let's say you start knowing nothing about the genealogy of the surname whatsoever. So what you're going to do is you're going to encourage uh, a bunch of men with that surname to take a DNA test. And then once you've got those results back, some of those men will match each other and some won't. So the ones that match each other, you can think of as what I would call a genetic family. So they're people who share the same surname, they're men who share the same surname, and they share the same Y chromosome heritage, which is almost invariably an indication that they share the same surname-bearing ancestor within, within the last 500 or 1,000 years. So within the genealogically relevant time frame, they, there's a connection for them built around their surname. Once you've got those uh, men tested and those genetic families sorted out, you can keep adding more men into the testing cycle and your genetic families will become more and more distinct. But eventually, you're only going to work out who is related, uh, how, how those people are related to each other by doing documentary genealogical research. So individual men might have their own family trees, but you might not be able to link them up. So someone somewhere, at some point, is going to have to do a deal of documentary research and work out how those individuals within the genetic families are linked together. Because what a genetic family is, is an unresolved family tree. If you have two men with the same surname, with the same Y chromosome result, what you're saying to them is, you belong within the same family tree, you just don't know how to document it yet. So the only way to resolve that issue is for people to go out and document those family trees and then to work out how everyone is linked together. Now, let's say you, you spend time doing that documentary research, you end up with a set of well-documented family trees consistent with the genetic data that you've used to build up the genetic families. Um, and so you've linked those trees within the genetic families. Uh, you should end up, each genetic family becomes then a single family tree. And this might sound a bit theoretical, but when I show you some results, you'll see how it works together. But what's really interesting is this fifth one down at the bottom here, medieval documentary research. 
because there's only a finite distance back in time you can go using DNA testing, Y chromosome DNA testing, in order to confirm the Y chromosome signature of a particular ancestor. And I'll show you, when I show you some results, you'll see how this works in theory. Which means that we end up, if you've got a very, very ancient surname, like an Anglo-Norman surname, you, have, you end up having to do a lot of medieval research. By medieval, I mean pre-1550. So it could be early modern and medieval research. Um, because there's no way around it. If you want to find out how those early families are linked to the original family that came over in the Norman Conquest, you've got about 500 years of history you've got to research in there. Now there's a slight variation. If you start with a, um, a genealogical um, uh, research already done, the way you could, it's a slight variation in the way you can introduce uh, Y chromosome testing into that process. And the first one here would be, you've documented your family trees, so you look, that's where you, you're starting point. so that you can then DNA test individuals within each tree. You're not taking anyone with the surname who comes along, as you would do with this approach. You're looking for specific men within specific trees, and you're, you're trying to DNA test individuals, so you get a, a genetic signature, a genetic result, for each family tree. So actually, with this approach, you probably need to test fewer men than you would testing over here. Because you'd want to keep on testing men to make sure you've found all the DNA results. So that when you come to document your family trees, you've got everyone sorted out into their genetic families before you start the documentary research. But with this fruit, you already know the trees, so you've tested one, two men in each tree. You've linked those trees which you weren't able to link before into genetic families, and then you've resolved those genetic families down to a single family tree. Those three stages could take 10 or 20 years, even if you're working quite hard at it, and you've got a number of people doing the research. So it's actually quite hard to force this research forward. It's, it's about bringing lots of data in, having lots of people working on it, and having a, a way of which you can coordinate your research and do your research. I don't really think for any significant size to this surname you could actually do all this work on your own. And what we're tending to see now is a lot of the projects that are combining DNA and documentary research are working very well with um, quite large groups of people coordinating their research together. But you'll see these last two, um, three and four down the bottom here, linking the trees within the genetic families and the medieval surface. That's exactly the same as over here. So the only variation is within the first couple of stages. When you start with genealogical research and then tailor the way you bring individuals into the DNA testing program, or when you test, you know, genetically DNA test anyone you can find, create your genetic families, and then afterwards start working out exactly how they're all linked together. So when you're working with a um, Y chromosome testing and a surname, you've basically got two origin hypotheses that you're working with. So the first one would be, has the surname a single ancestor? And the question you'd ask is, okay, is that going to be all name bearers of that surname? Or could it be all name bearers plus a range of variant spellings? So this would be your, your this is what people hope for. You want a single ancestor because they both your research and your um, DNA testing will be relatively straightforward. But then, sitting against this is a, a rival hypothesis always, which is, does the surname have multiple ancestors? So the question then would be, if it has multiple ancestors, are there just a small number of family trees, which are obviously going to be quite large, because they've survived over a long, long period of time, or is there quite a large number of family trees? You've actually quite no real way of telling from the outside, and even when you're doing the documentary research first, it's quite difficult to, to form an opinion uh, on this to start with. And so the question then would be, is if you're seeing new name bearers with different DNA uh, coming in, how are those new name bearers coming into the, uh, the, 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 the surname? Are they, are they coming in through illegitimacies within the traditional lines of uh, traditional families, 
or are they um, taking on the surname for conscious but unrelated reasons? And there could be several reasons why at different times in the past people decided to call themselves by a particular surname. Um, so you have to un unravel all of this. But in your mind, you've got these two rival hypotheses of the single ancestor one and the multiple ancestor. Broadly speaking, you could say that a rare surname is quite likely to have a single ancestor. A rare surname is less likely to have multiple ancestors as its head. Conversely, a very, very common surname is almost certain to have multiple ancestors and less likely to have a single ancestor. But where the dividing line is, nobody actually knows. Uh, I've, I've got some opinions about where it might be, and I think that we're the single, the single ancestry model is more common than you might think. But we don't have enough results back from uh, a series of DNA and documentary uh, combined projects where we can start to put a finger on this. It's not exactly clear. Um, so I'm going to show you some results quickly which in, a, in a minute which will fill out some of this sort of theoretical stuff and give you something to look at in, in, in detail. I just wanted to run through a couple of points and caveats before I do that. I've used this phrase, uh, name bearers. And so obviously I'm referring here to people who carry a particular surname. It's the surname within the project that you're working on. But there are quite a number of ways in which you can qualify that phrase. So uh, firstly, I would distinguish between historical name bearers. So those are people who have carried the name in the past, but are not necessarily alive today. Um, um, and they're, as it were, uh, contrasted with living name bearers. And this is where it gets interesting, because this is the group that you're working with when you're doing your documentary research. Obviously, you can't work with anyone who's not here, but you can only work with the living, who are still, who are still doing their research and can still give you information about the family. When you're working with um, uh, DNA testing, um, you're lo looking specifically for adult name bearers because they're the only ones who can take the DNA test, specifically adult male name bearers. So whilst the number of historical name bearers might be quite large, and the number of living name bearers not insignificant, by the time you get down to living adult name bearers, you're talking about a, a much smaller proportion of the total number of people who've ever carried the surname. And I would say that since uh, we're talking in a UK context here, the people who are really interested are the living adult male UK resident name bearers. And there's a very simple reason for this, which is that the um, growth rates within families are different in the UK over the last three to four hundred years than they are in the United States. Um, there are more people with the Pomeroy surname today in the United States and North America than there are in the United Kingdom, even though we've been settled here for about three times as long. Well, two and a half times as long. The reason for that, as far as I can tell, is that the conditions for population growth in the UK have been relatively um, stable and predictable. There's been, there's been no huge expansion um, at least not since the Black Death. Whereas in America, you can imagine that um, immigrants moving from east to west and arriving in, in America, encountering a virgin territory, there were was, there was strong reasons why you might want to have a large family and to expand quickly. And on a, that's on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a generic level. That specifically within our, um, our research, we've come across one or two immigrants who've moved across and then had large families with, with lots of sons very early on. And if you have that pattern at the beginning with a rapid expansion at the beginning, you tend to find that those families just get bigger and bigger and bigger. They're not going to die out, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the, other, the other thing I would mention is that when you're testing within a family tree, you need to DNA test more than one individual within that tree. Uh, and there's a reason for that, which is if, you, if I was to take, when I take a DNA test, the DNA test only tells me about my DNA. It doesn't even necessarily, uh, it tells me about my father, uh, 
my, my father's DNA. It doesn't necessarily even tell me who my father is unless I actually DNA test my father. It only tells me about my DNA. In order to find out about a, an ancestor somewhere up along my tree, I have to DNA test someone else who is linked along the male line who is as a distant cousin as I could possibly find. So let's say I have a distant cousin who is related to me through my great 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 grandfather up here. If I have the same Y chromosome result and he has the same Y chromosome result, what we're inferring is the Y chromosome result of this common ancestor. And that's how this whole process works within a family tree. Um, it's, it's telling you that if you both can, um, uh, you both have the same Y chromosome result, you can find, you will eventually be able to find the link by documenting it. So, whenever you're working on a family tree, you have to be very careful to make sure you've DNA tested more than one individual. Because if you've only DNA tested one, you've only uh, reached a conclusion about the person you've tested themselves. The other thing that we need to bear in mind is that documents can always reach further back in time than DNA. That might sound a little bit strange when you're talking about um, a DNA result which gives you some insight into your deep ancestral background. So, for example, the migration history of your ultimate male ancestor, where they came from across Europe, and all, all that kind of information, which is genuinely useful and interesting, but it's not applicable within a genealogical context. It's not going to help you very much with your genealogy and recreating your family tree. Um, and what I've noticed working with, within my project, and it, and it is a general truth, is that we go back to what I said about finding the distant cousin and DNA testing them so you can infer the DNA result of the common ancestor. What it turns out is, is that very often, almost universally within family trees, the distant cousin is not so distant. Because only some lines within the tree have not dorted out. And that date of the common ancestor usually turns out to be around about 1700, 1750, sometime around that date. It's quite difficult to get back beyond that and find within an old established family tree individuals where you can infer further back than around about 1700 using the DNA result. But of course, when you're documenting a family tree, you can usually take it further back than that. Particularly if you're working in a surname context where you're collecting all the data for a surname and you're, you're actively trying to reproduce those family trees. Um, it's, within our project we had, even before we started the DNA side, 10 years ago, we had a number of family trees that went back to the beginning of parish records. So 50, around about 1550. So you have also to be aware that when you're combining DNA and traditional genealogy, the traditional genealogy has a further reach than the DNA, and you will ultimately be relying on that traditional genealogy for at least half of your reconstruction. So it could be that you can rely on the DNA to uh, corroborate your um, documentary research back to about 1700, with that common ancestor that you're able to infer his DNA result, because you've had two distant cousins and they've got the same life form as any result. But beyond that, you're relying upon the documentary research. That might be from 1700 to 1550, or in the case of an Anglo-Norman surname, it might be back, it would be back several hundred years beyond that. And so the final point down here at the bottom, the, the number of living or historical name bearers in a tree is not proportional to the age of the tree. It would be really nice if all trees were, as it were, the same shape, but they're not. You can have a tree which is very, very old and which will end up by being very, very narrow. And that's because maybe in each generation there are two sons, only one of whom has two sons, only one of whom has two sons, only one of whom has two sons. You can see how it will exist for many generations over time, but it will never get any bigger. But if you have an ancestor who has five sons, and four of his five sons have five sons, and four of them, you can see that you're going to end up with a very, very wide tree. And I, this is something I'm still trying to get my head around, is exactly how much variation there is in the shapes of the trees. Because it does seem that um, we have some very um, uh, 
dreams that we can't take that far back in time, we have a documentary issue about, which are nonetheless extremely wide in their shape, and which have a great number of living name bearers. There's one tree that we have that has about almost 10% of the total number of living name bearers, but we can't get it back much more than about 200 years. And that's because of this um, feature of, 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 the, of a, an ancestor having many sons, then having many sons, where the tree spreads very wide, very, very quickly. Uh, by contrast, some of the older trees are these tall, narrow ones, um, which you, you wonder how they could possibly have survived, because it seems that almost in every generation they're about to die. Um, but the key point here is you have to be very careful what you try and infer from the DNA data. If you're using this route one approach up here, which is DNA-led, you can't look at the DNA results and see a large number of people with the same DNA result and say, oh, that must be the most important family because it's got the most DNA results. Or that must be the oldest family because it's got the most DNA results. It doesn't work like that at all. You have no alternative but to go back and to do the documentary research to work out how the DNA and documentary data fit together in order to create those transparent trees. So you have to be careful what you're inferring. Right, with all that in mind, let's have a look at some, some real results here. This is one slide that I'm putting up about the Pomero project. Um, I'm not going to talk about my project in a great deal of detail, because I know that listening to other people's genealogy can sometimes be about as interesting as watching paint dry. Um, we can go into lots and lots of detail, and none of which you need to know. So I've summarized it and I've condensed it down into one slide, which is a, a map. Um, in order to try and explain what a project can look like when you've gone through that route one, route two approach and you've done the first three stages. So you've had your DNA testing, you've um, linked people into genetic families, and now you're doing the documentary research to resolve all of those genetic families down to a single tree each. So, what this map shows is the geographical distribution of family trees within our project as it currently stands. Uh, I've used this slide for a number of years um, because actually we haven't done very much work in our project for a couple of years. Um, but the next year and a half are going to be um, rather different as we get ready for 2016. So there is an, <coughs> quite a bit of data in here, but not all, of, um, not all of the possible data that could be shown is on here. So I'll explain exactly what each pin re <coughs> excuse me, represents. Um, the physical location pin is important because what it marks is the geographical parish that the research has linked that tree to. So each pin is a separate family tree that we're currently researching, and each pin is centered in the parish where that research has linked it. Yet what it doesn't show is the age of these family trees, so, uh, for example, I know this one quite well, and I know that goes back to about 1750, whereas this one up here, I know goes back to 1550. It would actually be quite complicated to incorporate a timeline into this. But, so, we're just seeing a snapshot of the, the focus on the geographical uh, uh, facet of this data. But the other thing you notice um, is that it's, they're color-coded. And the color coding is important because these are Colour coding represents the genetic families. So these four here, the purple ones, these family trees have uh, one or two men in each of them, and their DNA results are the same, and they're identical across the trees. So those individuals in those four trees are a genetic family. And so this process works by thinking that these four trees are ultimately resolvable down into a single tree. This is my research problem, is how to um, research these four trees um, through documentary means and convert them into a single family tree. Once I've done that, they will turn grey, because grey is um, the colour for a single family tree with a consistent DNA result that is found nowhere else within our project. As you can see, we've got quite a number of grey 
pins here already. So I'll just point out the genetic family. So you've got this purple one here, the two green ones here, uh, three blue ones here, four crimson ones here. And you'll notice those gen genetic families are already quite geographically concentrated. And that's a testament to how detailed the documentary research has been and how almost all of our trees are back to the 1600s, 1700s. So you can start to see them um, pins coalescing within distinct geographical areas. And then we've got this one odd one, which is this bright red one, which has got one tucked in there. Um, I can't quite account at the moment as to why this area of Dorset has got representatives of three genetic families in it. It's possible that that um, bright red one here is a mistake somewhere in the genealogy, but I haven't been able to find it yet. Um, so you can imagine that as we carry on in the next year or two, all of those colours will disappear. The number of pins will, will be reduced because the number of family trees will be consolidated into, a, into in, each into a single family tree. And so you're going to end up with a map covered with grey pins. Uh, a few white ones as well because the white ones indicate family trees uh, where there is no one who is um, available or willing to take a test. So these ones have living descendants, they're usually one or two, and I've asked both of them, and they've said they don't want to take a DNA test, so there's nothing I can do about it. I will never be able to find out what the, their DNA signature is for that, for that tree. So eventually, we're going to end up with this map of, of, of grey pins, and at that point, within the combined DNA documentary process, we will have used all the DNA data that we can in order to help us work out the origins of the surname. And beyond that, there then lies another couple of hundred years span of time where we have to use documentary research in order to work out exactly what are the origins. Because I, my, the picture I see here is a reduced number, let's say maybe about 15 or 20 pins on there, all grey, and we have to start to try and work out how they're all connected together. Now as it stands at the moment, there's no DNA test that's really going to help us with that. We've exhausted the possibilities open to us with existing tests. Um, and I've, I've got a number of theories about this, and I suspect that if you map the um, uh, land holdings of the original Pomeroy family. The castle is down here, very Pomeroy Castle, but they had lands around here and also up here in Exeter. And there seems to be some sort of correlation between the geographical distribution of the lands that they owned in the Doomsday Book and the spread of these trees as you start to see this. So this is covering a span between 1550 and about 1750 broadly. The other thing about this map is I haven't tried to indicate which trees have more historical name bearers in them than others. But this one's only got about 80, whereas this one's got about uh, about a thousand. No, this, yeah, this one's got about a thousand. So it would, it, would, it would be too complicated to try and put that dimension into this map as it stands. So, bearing that map in mind, as the result of you know, 10 years or more of DNA research and documentary research that's gone into it. Uh, you, you have a review of the project data as it stands at the moment. So about almost all of the living UK resident adult male name bearers are linked to a tree that's been Y chromosome tested. So they're on here somewhere. There are one or two outliers. There's still a couple of trees in London we haven't resolved and one or two in Ireland, but broadly they're on that, on that map. So around about 40% of these uh, living men, um, adult males have a DNA result that's unique to their tree. So they are, oops, so they're in one of these grey ones. Um, and about 10% have a DNA result that's unique within their tree. Because this is the other feature when you start to combine DNA and um, documentary research, is as the trees get bigger and bigger, as you document them more and more accurately, you find that within each tree, you might have more than one DNA signature. And 
and that's for very traditional reasons, um, reasons of people um, uh, within um, within wedlock or outside of wedlock uh, illegitimacies, where new genetic material is brought in from outside the surname, but the surname itself is passed on from one generation to another. Um, as I mentioned before, there. Currently, in our current research, you can see these five genetic families, one, two, three, four, and five, which are still there, and they contain um, um, I mentioned the, the ten trees that were not tested at all. Uh, the other feature is that uh, once you add the documentary research, there's a very, very high proportion of those trees have recorded emigrants in them, and emigrants who've gone abroad and successfully started families overseas. Um, however, eight of those trees um, have no living UK descendants now. Another feature we found is that when you document trees, you end up with some trees which have, uh, using historical data, that have no living adult male, males alive in the UK, but some of these early emigrants have successfully created families overseas. So these, these, these overseas name bearers you can then bring into the DNA testing because they are the only people available on the planet for you to test. So your starting point is there's no one alive in the UK you can test, so then you can look overseas. However, if you're just generally testing anyone worldwide, you have to be careful about how you weight the project because you might well have very, very large families overseas which will skew your, um, your results data. So basically, adding all that, putting all that data together based upon the DNA evidence, so there's a, a maximum of 25 trees. Actually, there, there are bound to be fewer than that. But there's a maximum. Once you've reduced um, these 20 trees that have a unique Y chromosome signature and the five genetic families, each of them down to a single family tree, 20 plus 5 makes 25. But it's certainly going to be much, much less than that. And if you think over the lifetime of the project, if you take the number of living adult males, there are probably something like about 600 couples. And so those have all been condensed down to those 25 family trees, and that number will carry on going down as the documentary research continues. So what's our working hypothesis? Well, clearly there are a few distinct and unrelated trees containing multiple genetic signatures. So those would be those big old trees with, with multiple DNA signatures in them. And those, I'm sure, are caused by regular illegitimacies or name changes for other reasons, probably in the early modern or medieval period. Um, we, we kind of sort of don't think about the impact of the illegitimacies beyond the censuses, which is where we start to see them because it's labelled in there, or we start tracking people back through the censuses and we can't find them when they were born and things like that. But actually, illegitimacies within um, surname lines have been going on since, since, since surnames began. So it's quite clear that we, some of these big trees will incorporate large numbers of the name changes and illegitimacies with new DNA material coming in. So I think there are a few distinct unrelated trees, plus a few freestanding trees where the initial ancestor adopted the name for, for whatever reason. Um, so the, the basic thesis would be, at the moment would be, that there, we have a kind of a multiple ancestry picture but with an underlying core of a few original early trees. And of course the next step to try and resolve exactly what that picture is, is this pre-1550, this medieval documentary research. Because um, once this map has been reduced, as it were, back to 1550, and all the genetic families have been, have been linked together, you've still got another four, five hundred years of research to do. So with the single origin hypothesis, because it's useful to hold the hypothesis even if you think there are multiple ancestors. So the question we'd ask using this hypothesis is, is the variation in the DNA results um, was it coming out uh, as due to those very early illegitimacies? And the other question that follows from that is, are moves to new physical locations triggered by them? 
so this is the question I'm answering now, is what mechanism was making people move um, around the county? Why do we have trees in the 1500s in several different places around the country if they appear to be in different trees? Um, and if we had perfect documentary research knowledge, and we could go back to that map again, um, how many trees would we see and what would that distribution map look like? The map's only a tool, it doesn't tell us, as it were, the truth. It's just a tool that we can work with in order to try and better understand how to manipulate the documentary data and, and how to uh, try and link the trees together. So I reckon that our current 25 trees, let's assume we've resolved our genetic families, I think we'll end up as a couple, let's say two large trees, containing roughly about half of all historical name bearers, maybe five, ten smaller ones with the other 50%. But what's really interesting is about half of the um, adult male name bearers, the living ones, will be holding a DNA signature which is uh, clearly originated from outside of the surname. So they would, it would belong to either people who've taken on the surname for a conscious reason, or as a result of an illegitimacy at some point between the present and going back, you know, you know, back to, the, to, the, to the origin of the surname. So that's it, a very brief overview of the project as it stands at the moment. And I brought out some of the themes within the project that we've been working on to give you an idea of the two different ways in which you can um, initiate and develop a study, and then some of the problems that you'll come up with as you go through it. And I highlighted that whenever you're working with DNA, you're going to end up at a point where you can't use DNA anymore, you have to go back and rely on traditional genealogy. And that genealogy will be primarily within the early modern and medieval period. That might not be a very good prospect, but it's, it's nonetheless true. But you remember right at the beginning I talked about the question we ask now is about what can Y chromosome DNA testing tell us within a single surname, the surname that you're studying. But the future we're going to be asking how can we compare the results we've got for our surname with the results for other surnames. And this for me is really where the, the huge benefit of DNA testing really is going to come into its own again, because it's going to accelerate the process by which we can work out what a surname looks like when it's reconstructed. And then we can also compare on the DNA level one surname with another. So I've just popped up four questions here as a way of thinking about this process and how it's developing and how the, the study of genetics and um, documentary surname studies are developing. So the first question here, what kinds of links is how surname um, with already identified variants. So, for example, within my projects, the Pomeroy projects, there's Pomeroy, Pomeroy, Pomeroy. There are a number of variations which, if I gave them as in a list to any of you, you'd look at them and say, yes, I could, I could imagine that those are variants within the main surname. They probably all form a single core surname that's just spelled in different ways for various historical reasons. So, where we stand at the moment, when you do that reconstruction work and you work with the DNA testing um, across those different trees, you can answer that question. <laughs> and uh, many projects have been able to answer it, and we've been able to answer it uh, fully to our satisfaction, which is that actually the spelling of the surname is the most volatile aspect of this whole process. Um, like you, and I'm sure you're like me, you grow up in a family and your mum and dad, they tell you, oh, your surname is really important, spell it properly. But you can, I can tell you that two or three generations ago, no one really bothered that much about the spelling. It, it, the spelling is more subject to mutation from one generation to the next than your DNA is. Um, but anyway, the, the, the takeaway point from this is that um, Variants are quite likely to belong, recognizable variants are quite likely to belong within a single surname, a core surname. And you can use the DNA testing to uh, help test that. You could, you could do that on, on its own. You could do that simply before you start the documentary research. But once you've built 
the documentary research and the DNA testing in together, you end up with a, a family tree that's a composite of the two types of data, then that answer will be, will be, will be there loud and clear. The second question, what surnames are linked to the DNA results, the haplotypes that we've identified within our surname? Well, this has only partly been answered at the moment, and the reason it's only been partly answered is because the data for that is difficult to get at. Um, it would be nice to go to Family Tree DNA and just type in a surname, and you'd see all the results come up. Type in another surname, compare the results. You can't actually do that at the moment. You, you can create those searches, and maybe they're only partial searches because you have to go into the projects, and the projects don't necessarily have every result in there that you can see, and they, some of those results might be somewhere else in the database under a different project label. But you can, you can kind of, if you work hard, you can try and recreate that. Um, but I would say at this point that being able to look at the haplotypes you've got within your own project and see really clearly what other surnames have also exhibit that haplotype, that's, that's kind of possible, but it's difficult to do. And of course, this is the next stage where we're starting to think in the future about what we really want to do with our surname results and, and the DNA results that we've got. So the other question I would ask, and um, particularly one I'd like to ask about our surname, because it it's, has a historical presence in Devon that's very well um, affirmed over a number of centuries, is do we share our DNA results with other surnames in the same geographical location? At the moment, that's very difficult to do. Um, I've been able to build up a list of surnames that originate in Devon. And I've actually got a, a much wider list of surnames around the country, which is quite useful. It's taken me quite a long time to build that up. But um, going through each of those surnames one by one and checking to see whether they've got a project and then seeing whether anything comes up. Or alternatively, going through the individual DNA results for each individual that I can access as a project manager and checking which surnames come up on their matches. That's a very, that's a very long-term uh, activity. And so far, I've not been able to find the time to do that. So I would say at the moment, it's difficult to access that data. And then the other final question would be, what is the geographical spread of the surnames um, that we've identified in this stage? Are all these surnames uh, linked um, all the haplotypes that we found in our surname, we look at other surnames where those are found in, do we see a consistent pattern across, our, across the entire surname? So, is everyone linked to Devon, or is uh, some of those haplotypes that they linked to surnames that have a concentration somewhere else in the country? And where that would be really useful is when you're looking to try and unravel those illegitimacies particularly those older ones. I suspect that most of those will be within the same geographical area as the surname itself, because I suspect what that will demonstrate is the illegitimacies are quite old uh, back in historical time. I think really the key point here is that the current generation of work that's been done in the last 15 years is really focused on the particular surname that you're working on. And the next generation of work is going to be on comparing results of surnames together. And one or two people have started to do this. Um, there's a lady in America called Susan Meeks, uh, who is a member of the Guild of One Name Studies, who's done quite an interesting project on her surname. She looked at variants, she got the same answer. Um, she then started to look at uh, the historical background of the area of Staffordshire, where that surname originates. And she tried to look for other surnames that could possibly be related, went away and DNA tested them, and was able to demonstrate uh, a genetic connection as well. So what she was able to find was that the surname that she assumed was her core surname with lots of variants in it actually was a variant of another, as it were, uber surname, a meta surname, which itself is as, as the, the spelling has changed in so many different ways that it's not recognizable anymore. And she was able to do that through the DNA testing and bringing that back 
into the documentary research. So far, she's pretty much the only person that I've come across uh, within an English context who's been able to do that. But this is where it will get really interesting in the next 15 years, is when lots of projects start to combine their data, and you've got the geographical origin of the surnames fixed, and then you can start to see connections between the different surnames that you hadn't understood before. I've overrun by five minutes on a new, uh, new tour. Um, I have a feeling going through this, because I've, I've done about 70 or 80 lectures in the last 10 or 15 years, that maybe this was slightly complicated. I will forgive you if you've got lots of questions, and I will certainly forgive you if you tell me that it's, it's not pitch dry. So feel free to ask any question you want. If you're shy about asking a question, you can hang around, loiter at the end, and you can ask me individually because I will be here until the end of the day. Um, but other than that, thank you very much. You've been very patient, and thank you for bearing with me. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, um, who would like to kick off with questions for Chris? Yeah, we have them here on the back. Thank, thanks very much for a fascinating talk, Chris. Um, I'm very interested about your thoughts about the future, and uh, especially about the prospects for as I say, combining projects. Do you think it's, it's, it's realistic for a project coordinators will do that, share data, and put into the public domain the information that may or may not be in the public domain? Um, I don't want to estimate how likely it is, but I know where the data is. The data is over there. <laughs> so, yes, I, mean, I, I think it's just uh, an, an awareness is building up as to how important it is to unlock the data and to be able to compare it. And I would, that, I mean, that's what my focus is on at the moment. There are other people who are, who are reaching the same conclusion, who, whose work is getting to the same level um, of, of, of preparedness. So I, th I think that really will be the next stage, yes. But when, I'm not sure. Other questions? I have one here. Very interesting talk, thank you very much. Um, I was just curious, you've talked about liaising with um, people in the UK and in the States, as the name is obviously more. Have you broken to any, anyone in France, for example? Are you, are you able to bring them into the, the, the research? Um, we are talking to people in France, simply because with the reunion coming up, we don't have some, <laughs> some French people there. Um, there is an old chateau that was supposed to be uh, part of the land holding of the original family when they came over. Um, um, so we'd like the mayor of that, that particular place to come over. Um, but in terms of DNA testing, no. And my understanding is that the rules for DNA testing uh, for consumers are different in France. Um, and I don't really want to go into that area, particularly on YouTube. Um, but there's no particular benefit for us in trying to spend a lot of time sampling name bearers in France. There are name bearers in France, um, in particular my surname, which is, um, which is visible over there, but I've never tried to, to, um, to, to take a DNA test from them. For one particular reason, is that I know that my great, great grandfather was illegitimate, and therefore whatever they've got, it won't be the same as what they've got. So there's no particular reason at this stage to do that. Any other question? I have a question, actually. Yeah. You, you've got about 40 different branches on that map. Have you researched each of those trees yourself, or is there a group of people that is researching each of those trees? Like you have 40 individuals? No, there aren't 40 individuals. As with most projects, there's a small core of people that have done most of the work and a larger number of people who've fed information or data or enthusiasm or money into it. Um, I would say that there are a core of five researchers. And sometimes they've been focused on particular geographical areas or particular problems. And in doing, solving that problem, they've built up an, an expertise in another group. But when you put it all together, then you end up with um, uh, a composite picture. And I have to say, though, that with the advent of lots of 
computerized data online and the ease with which you know, people can now use databases and spreadsheets. But um, another uh, a guy I was working with about five years ago, I sort of became aware in our conversations that he was going through exactly the same data consolidation exercise that we'd already done. And I said to him, look, you can either stop because we've done it, or you can carry on and we'll look at the differences when you look at the data compared to what we, what we think. And actually, surprisingly, a, a lot of issues that we had have been resolved because he just looked at the data in a different way. Um, the other thing that sort of came out of the project specific to the DNA process is there were some very well-cherished, hallowed family trees that existed prior to DNA testing, which I have to say have no longer stood the, the test of the last decade because they were built up using data that was available, documentary data that was available in the, in, let's say in the 70s, in the 80s, even in the 90s. People were putting these family trees together without reference to the age of the large national data sets that you can now work with, you know, starting from 1840, and also without the benefit of DNA testing. So some of those DNA, uh, some of those um, cherished family trees have been passed around a group of researchers, they've gone online, they've been printed so many times in books, and they've gone all that. Uh, but then the DNA evidence just didn't stand up with it. And unraveling those has taken a bit of time, and I suspect there's still a bit more unraveling to be done. But broadly speaking, um, you couldn't, I don't think you can do a documentary project without the DNA side, and I don't think you can complete get the benefit of the DNA side without the documentary research going into it. The two are so completely interconnected and interdependent, there's no way around it. But the question you asked was a group of people, yes, definitely. And the other thing I noticed looking at other projects is that they all tend to start with a group um, outlook now. And I would definitely recommend that. And the days when an individual researcher with a typewriter going to record offices, did all this on their own, because it was physically difficult to contact other people. That's been completely inverted. Now you've got a pool of people. It's, the, the challenge is trying to find those few people who really want to work on it and to form a cohesive group of historians working together. Um, do you actually use online family tree software like Ancestry.com, for example, and you have an online tree for each of the 40 branches that you have, and you take advantage of the hints, the little leaves that blow, uh, that tell you, click here and you'll find some census data or some other type of military historical data. Do you use that at all as a way of collaborating with other online users outside of the main group? Um, personally, I don't, no. And that's purely for a, a single decision that was made without any thought around about 1997. <laughs> because, um, the day I started doing research, I was uh, self-employed, I was in the office on a Sunday, I finished my work, and I thought, you know, I've always been interested in this. You know, my dad used to, I know my dad was interested, he never had a chance to do it, so I'll do a bit of research. And because I was in the office, I had the, the database access there, I thought, okay, I'll just put it into access, without even thinking about it. And now, 20 years later, it's still in access, and there's no way of porting that across into a program. Fortunately, the other guy who has been doing the parallel research, he's been doing his in a traditional family tree um, package. Uh, I'm not even sure which one, but he's very happy with that because he can export from that as a GEDCOM file. So, in fact, my, the, cons the consolidated work now has to be moved over and matched against his work, because he's got the data that's useful because it can be exported and printed out and, and used in different ways. So yeah, it's very often happens with projects because you make a principal decision right at the very beginning and then you end up realizing a decade later that maybe that wasn't such a smart decision. But you had no way of knowing at the beginning. Any other questions? Great. Well, listen, Chris, thank you very, very much for sharing all your expertise. It's fantastic to have somebody with such a pedigree in genetic genealogy and traditional genealogy to come and show us how the two can be married very, very effectively. And optimistic as well. And optimistic as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Pomery. Thank you.
I don't know. I'll find that later on. I'm just going to turn it off now because it is still recording. And there we go. Thank you, everybody.